You're listening to the Audacious Church Podcast. This message was recorded live at our Manchester campus. We know this is a great investment into your life. So tune in, listen up and stay focused. For any more information, visit us online, audaciouschurch.com. I'm going to read from the Bible right now, but before I do that, I want to set the scene so you get an understanding of what the verse is talking about that we're gonna read from. The Bible says that an angel comes to Zechariah who was married to a woman called Elizabeth and says to Zechariah, you are going to have a son and I want you to call him John. And he didn't believe it, he was disbelieving of the angel. Now, even though uh, Zechariah was a priest and he'd walked with God all his life, Now, even as an older man, when God says, I'm about to do something for you that's gonna blow your mind, he didn't believe it. The angel said to Zechariah, because of your unbelief, then you will not be able to speak until the day your son is born. The angel said to him, you need to name your son John. And even though John wasn't in the family tradition of names, that's what the angel said to Zechariah. And here's where we pick it up, Luke chapter 1, 57. It says, When Elizabeth was full term in her pregnancy, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbours and relatives, seeing that God had overwhelmed her with mercy, they celebrated with her. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child and were calling him Zachariah after his father, after tradition. But his mother, Elizabeth, intervened. No, he is to be called John. But they said, no one in your family is named John. They used sign language to ask Zachariah what he wanted him named. Asking for an iPad tablet, Zachariah wrote, his name is John. That took everyone by surprise. Surprise followed surprise. Zachariah's mouth was now open, his tongue was loosed and he was talking, praising God. Father, thank You for Your Word today. Thank You for this birthday season. I pray that You would minister to Your people and set a hope and expectation for the days ahead through Your Word today. Your living Word, I pray that Your living Word would come like a seed in our hearts and grow to bear a great harvest in all of our lives, we pray in Jesus' Name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Before you grab a seat, turn around, give five people a high five. Sophia and I have been back from sabbatical for two weeks. We were back in church last week. We arrived back into Manchester two Sunday nights ago. On the final days of the sabbatical, I was praying to the Lord and I said, Lord, I want You to give me a word for our lives. Give me a word for our church. Give me a word for this next season. And I felt God speak to me and say, expect Surprise, expect surprises. I got pretty excited by that. I thought, I don't know what that means, Lord. Should I, should I start doing the national lottery? Well, what, what, what should I do? And so over the final days of sabbatical, I, I was kind of, it was just percolating within me. Expect surprise. I sat down and began to write this message for you today for our birthday, a season where I believe as a church, we should expect surprise. But I wanna speak over you personally and say that you, I believe God's saying to you, that in this season, you should expect surprise. We arrived home a week last Sunday night, two Sunday nights ago, and went straight into a leadership team retreat. We were with our team Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then Wednesday night, as I was going to bed, it was about 11 o'clock at night, I made the mistake of opening my emails on my phone in bed. Now, one thing you need to know is I don't read my emails in bed but maybe after three months of never reading emails, I missed it so much. So I opened my emails and and, and all of a sudden, there was a series of three emails in my inbox 
And these emails caught me by surprise. The first one said, Dear Father, we would like to invite you to come to uh, Buckingham Palace in two days' time to have an audience with the King. And then it was signed off from Buckingham Palace and, 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 and uh, a certain individual. And I, like Zechariah, thought, this is a hoax. The next email said, not only do we want you to come and have an audience with the King, but we would love for you to stay over Saturday and then come back on Sunday because on Saturday, we want you to be a part of the pre-procession for uh, Her Majesty's funeral. And then on Monday, we want you in the Abbey as part of the clergy representing the church in Britain and being a part of, of the service. And I thought, this is definitely a hoax. I'm like Zechariah, I don't believe. God said, expect surprise, but I'm not believing the surprise. I annoyed my wife because I woke her up. I nudged her, I said, have a look at these emails. Do you think Pastor Stuart, Pastor Mark, do you think the team are having a wind up? I thought it was April Fool, just delayed a little bit. Kind of took me a little while to sleep, woke up uh, Thursday morning, spent about an hour or two making certain phone calls. We discovered it indeed was a, a legitimate Invite, and you can see coming up on screen now, a week last Friday, I had the honour of representing uh, our church and our movement of churches and spent some time with King Charles III. Expect surprise. I, I remember being in there thinking, this, this is a little bit surreal. This doesn't feel like, am I, am I really here in this moment? When I was introduced by one of his secretaries, I said, this is our Pastor Glenn Barrett from AOG. He said, how is Assemblies of God? How is your church? And I was able to spend some moments with him and uh, he said, oh, you're Pentecostals? I said, yeah. He said, where does the Pentecostal movement start? He said to me, he said, I know you started in America back in the early 1900s. I said, that's right, Your Majesty. He said, how did the Pentecostal movement start? And I said, well, it started in a prayer meeting. He smiled, he said, ah, yes, you Pentecostals answer to a higher voice and higher authority, don't you? I said, we do, Your Majesty. And then I was able to share with him our prayers for him during the season of mourning and also for his, his reign as King of Great Britain, of course, the Commonwealth as well. Next day, I found myself in Westminster Abbey in a pre-procession uh, that was due to walk in about maybe 50 minutes before the royal family. And when I found myself seated uh, in, in the practice seat about 15 yards from the coffin and the King Himself, I, I thought to myself, my gosh, expect surprises. In fact, in the robing room before the funeral down in Westminster Abbey, as all the clergy were putting on their robes and, and uh, I turned to Pastor Agu from Jesus' house and I said to Pastor Agu, have you got your robes? He said, I'm just wearing a suit. I said, me too. At least there's two of us in a suit. In fact, we were tempted when they mustered us at about five past 10, they mustered us next to where the, um, the choir robes were. I said, he attempted to take a robe. I said, He's, I, I said, I am. He said, I am too. <laughs> and, and just to, to be there and, and the honour of the moment. Now, listen, I think I've got a pretty good measure of myself. I, I would hope you would know that, that if any of you think that there's illusions of grandeur or anything like that. The reality is this, is that this message expects surprises and my preparation came way before the invite actually came. Seven days before God gave me a word and seven days later, God said, see, I told you, expect surprise. And the reality is this, right, is in the second week of our sabbatical, of three months away, our second weekend, God gave me a word. And this word kept coming back to my mind as I was walking through Buckingham Palace and in the different corridors that I was in, in Westminster Abbey, and then in the following meetings in London over the next two or three days. And the verse God gave me at the start of my sabbatical is from Proverbs 30 that says, a lizard can be caught with the hand, yet it's also found in King's palaces. Hey, Glenn, don't get too far ahead of yourself. Even a lizard can get in here. And all through my sabbatical, I was waiting on this passage in Proverbs 30, not really knowing why, why God 
gave the verse to me. But the reason I share that very real time story to you all today is because I really believe that God wants to solidify in our hearts right now to remind you and I that this is a season where you should expect surprises. It is time, God says, to expect surprise. Come on, you should be way more excited than that. Expect surprises. Hey, it's our birthday. Isn't it normal on a birthday to expect surprises? Isn't it normal that you wake up and, and if you're not living alone and you have family and people close by, that you wake up today with some sense of anticipation that because it's your birthday, someone will at least send you a gift or at least a nice email or text. Expect surprises. But here's the thing I want you to lay a hold of theologically. When you read the Bible from the book of Genesis all the way through to the final book, Revelation, you begin to realise the Bible is a book of surprises. Because God is a God of surprises. Because the Gospel of Jesus Christ, friends, is a Gospel of surprises. It's not what we thought. It's not what we imagined. That's why we clerical, clergy type people keep making up rules that are not in the book. Oh, you can't have balloons in church in praise. Since when? Doesn't say we can't in the book. In fact, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the reality is this is over time, over the last 27 and 28 years of being pastors, we've had emails from all sorts of people that say, well, you can't do this in church and you can't do that. And it shouldn't be like that. Why? It's all about the book and the book is all about surprise. Hey, how's this? Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the Bible says He created the world in six days and He rested on the seventh. Seven days. Surprise, science! It's not taught in schools. And many of you in this place will more believe in the evolutionary process of creation, of everything coming into being. But God says, surprise! Some people think, well, 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 maybe it's not seven literal days and maybe there's a gap between Genesis 1 verse 1 and then millions, hundreds of millions, billions even years of evolution and then there's another day. But the problem with the gap theory between verse 1 and verse 2 is that in verse 2 on the second day, God says it's good. And the nature of God is not to speak goodness over death and destruction and dog eat dog, survival of the fittest. That's not in God's nature. Surprise everyone. In fact, as I quickly go through the Bible, Moses never thought at the age of 80, he would finally be serving the purposes of God. Surprise Moses, Abraham's promise finally came. And then God said, hey, take your son up that mountain for sacrifice. Surprise Abraham, Caleb was 40. He was moments away from receiving his inheritance, moments away from receiving it, but he didn't get it until he was an old man of 85. Surprise Caleb, Ruth stumbled across her kinsman redeemer in a foreign field, in a foreign land. You'll be for surprised what happens in foreign lands and foreign fields. In fact, the Bible says it just so happens. The word is almost as strong as, as if by coincidence, Ruth met the man. She happened upon a field that was owned by Boaz, who was going to become her redeemer. Surprise, Ruth. There's a prostitute in the book of Joshua. She's in the Hall of Fame in the book of Hebrews. Surprise, clergy. Habakkuk surely thought that God that God would use a, a, a great superpower to judge the nation. He never expected that God would use a more morally corrupt nation to judge God's people. Surprise, Habakkuk. It's not happening as you thought. Jesus chose Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Judas, Rob, Rafaro, Reedy, Graham, surprise. No one, though it's mentioned all through the Old Testament, expected that Jesus would come from heaven and die for our sins, that He would take our place, that He would take our eternal place. He he would die so we could have a restoration and relationship with God. And even though all of the Old Testament speaks about it, nobody got it. The women running to the tomb, they didn't believe it because they had anointing oil in their hands. 
The disciples, they were scaredy cats in the upper room. They didn't believe it. And then the disciples on the road to Emmaus, they didn't believe it because they were running away now that God hadn't done what they thought. It's because my friend, I want you to know that God is a God of surprise. Paul, Paul prayed. Paul says in the New Testament, Lord, I want you to take this thorn out of my flesh. I want you to take away this difficulty. And God says, surprise, no. But I'm gonna give you my grace. And you're gonna find my grace is sufficient for you. You're gonna find that you can dance on disappointment like we sang about a few moments ago. Because even when God doesn't do things the way you want Him to do it, I want you to know the nature of God is God is a God of surprise. Come on, somebody. God is a God of surprise. And what God wants to do is God wants to continue to surprise you. He already has. You didn't even know you need Jesus, surprise. You were merry, merrily carrying on your business in school and university, going about in work. And then all of a sudden there was that sense of a gap, the sense of a loss, sense of a, a, a need something. And God comes and the Bible says, Jesus, He knocked on the door of your heart. He says, surprise, I'm real. Oh, Luke, you came into church as a single man. You came into the house of God as a single man and God says, surprise, Luke. I've got someone waiting for you, Luke. And she doesn't even know it, Luke, but I've got her, I've been preparing her. And there's gonna come a moment when you're gonna look across the auditorium, you're gonna go, oh my gosh. And she's gonna go, yeah, he's all right. (laughs) How many hundreds and hundreds of people have come into the house single over 15 years, fallen in love, got married, had children, God surprised you. And I wanna say this to you as well. It is my earnest plea that if you, if you come in single and God gives you a spouse in the house, then don't go and be all silly and be all silly when the babies come along and think, well, I just haven't got time for God and I haven't got time in God's house. Because the nature of God is God wants to continue to surprise you in His house. He can surprise you with a spouse in His house. He can surprise you with healing in the house. He can surprise you with breakthrough in the house. You gotta be in the house. I know people over the years who've driven for an hour every Sunday to come to church. They drove every half hour every Sunday and then they got married and then they had a few little kids. And then they said, well, Pastor, I just, I just wanna go to the church. I'm just gonna walk. I just wanna be in a church where I can walk to church. And I think, my gosh, you, you made the effort and God provided a miracle in the house. I wanna encourage you. There, there, there are more surprises for you in this house. Some of you, there's a life group, a living, vibrant community of small people that God is wanting to surprise you through. Some of you, many of you have got jobs while you've been in the house. God surprised you. Many of you got promotions you didn't even ask for. You prayed one or two prayers and then all of a sudden God surprises you one day and says, hey, promotion, pay rise. You're like, where did that come from? God says, surprise. God wants to surprise you folks. He's the God of surprise. And I know this is an anthropomorphism, but God can't help Himself. He's the God of surprise. He surprises us in every page, in every chapter, in every book, in every testament, in every covenant. God, He's the God of surprise. And I just want us to take a moment where you are watching right now in locations and in Manchester, praise break. Stand to your feet and let's give Him 30 seconds of praise. Let's thank Him for surprise, surprise, surprise. Come on, come on, let's thank Him for what He's done. Thank Him for friendship. Thank Him for breakthrough. Thank Him for healing. Thank Him for what He's done. Oh, come on, you can do better than that, church. We're giving Him a shout of praise. We're giving Him a shout of praise. We're giving Him a shout of praise. Come on, let's give Him a shout of praise in this place. All right. Now, now here's the thing, stay standing where you are. I want you to know God can't help Himself. He is the God of surprise. He is the God of surprise. And I sense there's a surprise around the corner. I sense it in your life, in our church, in our locations. I sense God saying, you ain't seen nothing yet. 
there's a surprise about to happen. Now, the surprise may not look like you thought it would look like, but you gotta know that whatever God does, God does good. And so whatever God has, it may not look like you want it to look, but either way, it's gonna be a surprise and He's always there. So the prize ain't here, but it's on the way. It's almost like He sent His heavenly host. He sent His messengers, He sent His envoys, He's going before, He's making a way. And you know what praise does? Praise is not something we do after the event or alone after the event, it's an anticipatory thing. We do it in advance. So here we go. I want you to think about it now. What is it? What's the surprise you're believing for? You're believing for a spouse or you're believing for just the security, being a single person. You're happy with that and you wanna stay that way. You're believing for healing. You're believing for a job. You're believing for promotion. You're believing for a new house. You're believing for God to do something remarkable in your family. You're believing for God to take away that, that, that depression away. You're believing God to take away the emotional turmoil. Here we go. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna give God a shout of praise for what He's about to do. One, two, three. Come on, all locations. He's a God of surprise. He's a God of surprise. Let's thank Him. Let's thank Him. Come on, give Him praise for what He's about to do. Give Him praise for what He's about to do. Yeah! Lord, we thank You for all that You are about to do. Thank You, Lord. In the same way, everyone was surprised with Elizabeth and with Zechariah and baby John. Thank You for the words of the angel to Mary in Luke chapter one and says, God has a surprise for you. We are giving you thanks for what you've done, what you're doing and what you are about to do. We give you thanks. Expect surprise, church, expect surprise in Jesus' Name. Grab a seat across this place, grab a seat. Let me just give you two Two very quick things about surprise. Number one, surprise changes your countenance. Woo! Surprise ensures you don't walk through life looking like you've been sucking lemons or been bitten by a wasp on the tongue. Surprise changes your countenance. You can see my son coming up on screen here right now. This was his birthday just a few weeks ago. Sophie and I and Georgia, we gave him a gift. That was the moment we gave Him the gift. I want you to see His countenance. The moment it was unexpected and yet surprise. When you live with a revelation, friends, that God is a God of surprise, when you live with thankfulness over what He has done, and when you live with expectation for what He will do, you can walk through life with a smile on your dial that makes everybody else wonder what you've been up to. You end up in work on a Monday morning and somebody looks at you and says, what have you been up to on the weekend? And, and there's a sense where there's something about your life that's attractive because you show it on your face. Psalm 121, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the Maker of heaven and earth. We haven't got time to really get into this today, but it, the, the Psalm of Ascent, Psalm 121 to uh, Psalm 134 is, is the pilgrims going from their villages and towns, they're making their way to Jerusalem for a feast. They're effectively going to the house of God. And that journey was fraught with, 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 uh, with difficulties and challenger, robbers, thieves, bear, thirst, uh, not bear, but wild animals, just, just a, a difficult, difficult thing. And, and the pilgrims would travel in caravans. They, they would travel in, in family groupings to, to keep them safe on the journey. And yet there would come a moment inevitably where off in the distance, the pilgrims could see the hills of Jerusalem. That mountain range just beyond the Kidron Valley there, uh, where, where Calvary, Calvary, where Golgotha, where Jesus died, was on that mountain range. On that mountain range was also Mount Moriah, about one or two kilometres from Golgotha, the place where Mount Moriah, the moment ago where Abraham and Isaac, they went together. This mountain range, I, I lift up my eyes to the hills. 
You know what's really interesting about the city of David, this the Zion, uh, where, where, where really God's city was, was earmarked thousands of years ago, was it wasn't the highest peak, it was in fact one of the lowest hills. All the other faiths and religions would put their temple and altar on the highest peak, but God, He says, no, 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 you don't need to put me on the highest peak, just that one over there, that's the one I'm earmarking because it's not about a place, it's about a person. And there was something for the pilgrim about seeing, looking and seeing that I look to the hills, where does my help come from? Not the altar on the hill, but my help. I was having coffee on Wednesday. I went to a coffee machine and um, I was down just north of London. And there was another gentleman there. He had a different um, ID tag to what I was wearing. And I asked him, said, who do you represent? Where are you from? And he told me the name of a particular global ministry that he is the CEO of. And it's involved in helping persecuted Christians around the world. We were chatting. He told me this story that in the last two years or so in a particular country of the world, a woman in her, I think around her mid-twenties or thereabouts, he didn't really say, but young woman, she had a moment where she converted to Christianity and got saved. Jesus knocked on the door of her heart. She said, I, I know uh, that the way I've been living, the God I've been following is not the true God. And, and Jesus, I want you. And she got saved. When her husband and her mother found out about it, they dragged her by the hair into the middle of the village, poured kerosene on her and set her to burn to death. Terribly burnt, terribly scarred, terribly disfigured. This ministry have flown her from her country to the UK where she's going, continuing to go through series of plastic surgery, skin grafts and all those sorts of things. And she is terribly disfigured. And yet the gentleman said to me on Wednesday, Glenn, she is one of the most beautiful women I have ever seen. He said, just in the last few weeks, I said, how is it that you can live through such atrocity and you can still just show joy and, and, and just have a beautiful expression on your face, though badly scarred? And here's what she said. Just recently, she said these words, and I'm struck by this. She said, it is perfectly reasonable to expect to find the very best of God in the very worst of circumstances. Oh, come on, friends, when you live with surprise, the surprise of God, uh, I'm not looking to the hills. I'm not looking to the new mini budget. Come on, somebody. I I'm not looking to circumstances. I'm not looking for the bus running on time, the clear, clear congestion charge, will it or won't it. I'm not looking to HS2. I'm not looking to the Conservatives or the Labour Party. I'm not looking to the person sitting next to me in church. I'm not looking to my pastor. I'm not looking to rep. I'm fixing my eyes on Jesus, the author. He's the perfecter of my faith. And now what it does is it changes my countenance because I'm expecting God to move. I'm expecting Him to do something in Jesus' Name. Daniel found God in the den. The three boys, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, found God in the furnace. Jonah found God in the whale. And I want you to know that wherever you are, whatever your season, God is with you and if you just change your heart and begin to expect surprise, I'm thankful for what He's done and now I am expecting surprise. The second thing as the Musos are already here, second thing is this, is I want you to know that surprise changes your position. I got an email a week last Wednesday and within a matter of a few days, it changed my position. You can see this picture coming up on screen now. This is the funeral of Her Majesty just on Monday. The King and top left, that's me. I'm the third person in, in case you didn't know. <laughs> Surprise! Changes your position. My favourite birthday present as a little boy was the table tennis table. When mum and dad bought me the table tennis table, it was a surprise, it changed my position though. I want you to know I was in the garage every day playing table tennis. I love that, surprise changes position. 
And I want you to know, friends, that in faith, there is something that we call positional faith. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 9b, and the Word of the Lord came to Elijah and God said, what are you doing here, Elijah? You are in the wrong position, Elijah. Elijah, you're not meant to be here. This is not where I asked you to be. I have shown you my favour and I have brought surprises to you, even though they were unexpected. Uh, Jezebel was her name, by the way. That's another story for another time. And you have now positioned yourself not where I want you to be. Do you know position, positioning is all through the Christian faith. Do you know the Bible says that even right now, if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, you are right now seated with Him in heavenly places. In other words, you look down on everything that's trying to swallow you up. It's a change of position. Oh, I, I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not a victim. I'm not broken. I'm not poor. I, I'm not lonely. No, no, I'm changing. I, I, I'm seated with the heavenly heart. I'm seated with Christ. I, I now look down. It's a change of position. It's actually a change of perspective. The Bible says He has made you right now the head, not the tail. Well, you either are or you're not. You're either the tail, the victim of past life and past generations and past difficulties, or you're the head. He says you're the head. What do you say? It may be fair that even right now, God is coming to you and saying, what are you doing here? What are you doing in this emotional state? What are you doing thinking about this? What are you doing reading books like that? What are you doing pasting those social media posts? You're the head, not the tail. Oh, the Bible says on a few occasions, He's brought me into a spacious place. That's not prosperity gospel. It's not American evangelist, evangelist, TV evangelist. It is the Bible. He brought me into a spacious place. And I want you to know that just like with Elijah, God can reach Elijah in the wrong place and He can reach you when you're in the wrong place. But I want you to know a change of position leads to a move of God. Let me say that again. A change of position will lead to a move of God. Ask Ruth, ask Esther, ask David, ask Solomon, ask Joshua, ask Caleb. In fact, find every Old Testament character and you will find their changing position and a change of position led to a move of God. In the New Testament, you can ask blind Bartimaeus, you can ask Jairus, you can ask the woman who was bleeding for 12 years, you can ask the, the man with the withered hand, you can ask the man who, who couldn't walk, who was outside uh, the, the, the temple, you can ask him a move of God, uh, uh, a change of position led to a move of God. That's why church is such an empowerful thing, folks. Weekly, changing your position to get in church for the praise, because if you miss the praise, you miss the point. The weekly habit of just getting your family together. We are going to church. I'm changing my position for a move of God. Did you know that's why small groups are so important? Oh gosh, it's been a busy day. It's been busy. Oh, I've got small groups and I, I, I'm just gonna stay home. I'm gonna miss it. I'm gonna send a text of apology. But you never know, friend, just you changing your position that night. Say, I can't, I don't wanna go because like Pastor Glenn said, small groups are either awkward or awesome and mine is still awkward. So I'm gonna stay home, but I'm gonna change my position. I'm gonna make the effort to get into community because who knows, God may surprise me at some point through the people in my small group. But how many of you know, we're not a selfish people. And now our prayer changes when we come to church. Now our prayer changes when we come to a church birthday. Now our prayer changes when we come to small group. Our prayer changes when we go to work. Now we're saying to the Lord, 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 use me to be your surprise. Use me to be your surprise to this nation and to my church and to my small group and to the people on my social media feed. Surprise people through me. I just wanna say to you folks, expect surprise. I gotta get out of here, we gotta get out of here. I'm hungry. What does this message mean for you? Well, listen, I wanna say this. You get what you expect. The Bible says, as a man and woman thinks in his heart, so he is. 
In other words, your life will lead you towards your most dominant thought. So now what I'm doing is this, I'm, I'm changing my thinking, I'm changing the position of my heart, I'm changing the position in my mind and what I'm doing now is, is I know that I'm gonna get what I expect and so here I am, Lord, I am open and I am expecting surprise. When it happens this week for hundreds of you, make sure you message me, won't you? It'll make a big difference from some of the messages I get from some people around the world. Just send me a message, find me on social media. If you're not following me on social media, why? Hey, Pastor Glenn, God's done this, God's done this, God's done this, God's done this, God's done this. And before long, you get so caught up in the favour of God that now you begin to become this conduit of blessing to other people. Stand to your feet, folks. Psalm 100, come on everybody on your feet. Psalm 100, on your feet now. Applaud God. Bring a gift of laughter. Sing yourselves into His presence. Know this, God is God and God, He's God. He made us, we didn't make Him. We're His people, His well-tended sheep. Enter with the purse password. Thank you. Make yourselves at home talking praise. Thank Him. Worship Him. For God is sheer beauty, all generous in love, loyal always and forever. Psalm 18. <laughs> but me He caught. Reached all the way from the sky to the sea. He pulled me out of that ocean of hate, that enemy chaos, the void in which I was drowning. They hit me when I was down, but God stuck by me. He stood me up on a wide open field. I stood there saved, surprised by love. Last verse, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So friends, today, position yourself, take a firm stand, feet on the ground. I lift up my eyes to the hills, head held high. Lift up your chins, Glenn. Keep a tight grip on what you were taught. Whether in personal conversation or by our letter, may Jesus Himself and God our Father, who reached out in love and surprised you with gifts of unending help and confidence. Today, Audacious Church, put a fresh heart in you. Invigorate your work and enliven your speech. Expect surprises. Come on, let's thank God for His Word today. Thank you for listening to this Audacious Podcast. For any more information, visit us online, audaciouschurch.com. We'd love for you to join us at one of our campuses, Manchester, Chester, or online, every Sunday, 10 a.m. and 12 p.m. 